All right, today is a good one. The Italian classic, Ciabatta. So ciabatta, classic Italian bread. I can't believe there's anyone out there who hasn't heard of it, but whether you've tried giving it a go yourself is another question altogether. So today we're going to be making a sourdough ciabatta, high hydration dough. Sounds a little intimidating, I know, but trust me, it's fairly simple and this recipe is actually quite forgiving. Uh, if you're someone that's been making sourdough and you want to experiment with higher hydration doughs, this is a great place to start because your goal is not to produce a nice, proud, tall loaf with a big ear on top. You're looking to create something sort of quite flat, knobbly and gnarly. Um, I think um, ciabatta translates to slipper in Italian, so that gives you an idea of what you're aiming for. Something kind of flat and knobbly, but it's all about the texture inside. You want that nice, open, light, fluffy crumb, and that is what we're going to be achieving by upping the hydration and just making sure we get our fermentation right. So for the recipe you're going to need 400 grams of strong white bread flour, 8 grams of salt, 80 grams of sourdough starter, so I fed mine last night, that's ready to go, a little bit of olive oil, about a tablespoon, but you don't need to add that, sometimes I don't, and then water, you need 320 grams of water. That's what I'm going to be using, but you can experiment with this. So 320 grams of water is going to give us an 81% hydration loaf, but you could start off at 300, which will be 77% hydration, or you could go up to 340 grams of water, taking it up to 86% hydration, uh, and just see how that affects the crumb. It's all going to be fairly sticky and difficult to work with, so really good practice and experience. So let's get going. In the bowl, the flour and the water, and we're going to mix them together and kick this off with an auto lease of about half an hour to an hour. So all you want to do is combine that water and flour into a shaggy mass, is how it's most often described. You're not looking to develop any gluten, you're just literally getting it mixed together, so like that. And because we're using quite a lot of water it really is easy, it just makes a very thick batter. There we go, I'll cover that with a tea towel and now leave that for 30 minutes to an hour and that will allow the flour to absorb the water and the gluten to start developing naturally and that's going to help us cut down our mixing time. Okay, so that's been half an hour auto leasing. Normally I would leave it for an hour, like I say, just to help cut down on the mixing time, just makes life a little bit easier. But now we need to add our starter, our salt, and a little bit of olive oil if you're using it. So into the bowl, let's get the starter in first. So you want 80 grams of starter. That's a 20% inoculation. So you can see it's nice and bubbly. There we go. Then eight grams of salt. And then just a drizzle of olive oil, about a tablespoon. There we go. And now, again, using the a spatula, this is a hard spatula, or you can use your hands, it's not a problem, but I just don't really like getting dough stuck all over me. So I'm just gonna use the spatula to mix that in and because it's quite a wet dough you really can just mix it like this and you want to mix it until the starter is incorporated into the dough as you mix it the dough will tighten so a different way to mix it is to almost think like you're whisking it so scrape the spatula in underneath, lift, and put it down again. So you just keep going like this. 
And what that's doing is mimicking, uh, in bakeries they have these mechanical arm mixers which go down and pick up the dough and stretch it. So it'll go down, stretches the dough, puts it down, the other one comes up. So it's doing this kind of action and you can mimic that by either with your hand, like this, or with a spatula, just like this. Once it's sort of broken all the way through, turn the bowl and pick it up from the bottom there. There we go, a couple of minutes should be absolutely fine. If you've got the strength for five minutes, be my guest, do five, but a couple of minutes, two or three, absolutely fine. There we go, that's looking nicely incorporated. So now, just scrape down the sides. There we go. It's ready to bulk proof. So we'll cover that with a tea towel. We're going to bulk proof this for four hours at room temperature and then we'll transfer it to the fridge overnight. So for the first two hours we'll do stretch and folds every half an hour uh, and then we'll leave it untouched for the final two hours before it goes in the fridge. So I'll come back in half an hour and show you the stretch and folds. Okay, so we're half an hour into the bulk proof. So now's the time to do your first set of stretch and folds. As we didn't do a huge amount of mixing, we'll kind of use this opportunity to finish off the mixing whilst doing the stretch and fold. So whereas normally you'd just do maybe four, one each kind of uh, quarter turn, this will do quite a few, help with the mixing, build up the gluten, but also start developing those layers with the stretch and folds. So if we wet our hand, and just scrape down the sides, grab the dough, stretch it up, fold it over itself. Wet your hand again, in, stretch, over, and just repeat that a few times. You can use your fingers just to clean down the edge of the bowl. Stretch, over, and you'll feel the dough tightening up as you do it. So it should, even though we're at a high hydration here, I think 81%, it should still come together in a ball. So we just keep going round. So that was normally where I'd stop, but we'll just keep doing a little bit of mixing almost. Just keep going round, stretching it over itself. Keep wetting that hand so it doesn't become too sticky. That's another reason for why I don't do this at like 85% hydration, I'll do it at 81 and then I can still get extra water in there whilst I'm doing this without worrying that it's going to get too sloppy. So now it's kind of released from the side of the bowl into a bit of a ball and now you can just pick it up and use the bowl to create traction. So put your hand underneath it lift the dough up and you'll see it stretches out on top and then you can kind of fold it in half before you pull your hand out. So I just do that a few times like that and you end up with quite a neat ball of dough. So again cover that, leave it for another half hour and do another set of stretch and folds and we're going to do that three more times that will take us up to two hours and then just leave it for that final two hours. But I'll show you the dough at the end of these two hours before you leave it for that uh, final bulk proof. Okay, so we've reached the end of the first two hours. It's actually been about two and a half hours. Um, so we can give it its final set of stretch and folds here. As you can see, it's puffed up a bit. We've got a bit of volume. So we're gonna be a little bit more gentle with these final stretch and folds. Then we're going to cover it with some cling film, leave it out for about two more hours at room temperature, and then put it in the fridge overnight for sort of say 12 hours. If you don't want to do a cold overnight proof, then again, finish the folds, 
cover it and leave it at room temperature for about three more hours and then put it in the fridge for just an hour. You still want that sort of fridge chilling time, not really to help develop the flavours, but to firm up the dough and make it a little bit easier to work with. So, for the final set of folds, as always, wet your hand, reach in, lift and fold. And we're just going to do it four times because we don't want to be squeezing out all the air now. We're at a nice delicate point. Lift and fold. Last one, lift and fold. And as you can see, it kind of released itself from the side of the bowl. So I'll put all the seams underneath. There we go. So that's the dough, nice ball. You can see it's still very wet and malleable. But now we're gonna cover that with the cling film. There we go, just enough. Like that. And then I will show you what to do once it's reached the end of its bulk proof. Okay, so our dough has proofed overnight. That's been over 12 hours for me, probably about 14 hours. And as we can see, it's puffed up a little bit more. We've got some big air bubbles on top. The dough is tacky, a little bit sticky, but it's definitely firmed up from the cold, and that's really gonna help us when we come to shape it. Uh, so with sourdough, you'd normally do a pre-shape, a bench rest, and then a final shape. But for the ciabatta, we're gonna slightly adjust that and do our pre-shape straight away, then leave them for a bench rest, and then just do a very little stretch just before the final proofing to make sure we get a good shape. You need quite a bit of flour on your worktop because this is sticky. So I'm gonna be using rice flour to dust the worktop, and I'm also gonna be using some semolina flour. Uh, it's quite traditional in Italian cooking. You see it in pasta recipes, uh, pizza dough recipes, and the good thing about it is we can get that on the cut side of the bread and not worry about it getting folded in and creating pockets of dry flour because the semolina incorporates into the dough, cooks, and it just becomes part of the bread. So you will need to get a good bit of the rice flour down. So we'll put a little bit in the bowl as well just to stop it sticking to the edge of the bowl as we tip it out. And then just ease it away from one side of the bowl and then hopefully if you hold it upside down the weight should there we go make it come out so there's our dough you can see the structure in there um, like the, the air bubble and the gluten strands so we'll pull that into the middle i can see that's sticking at the back there a little bit so we want to get it into a square basically so we can divide this into four so we're going to make four kind of mini ciabatta. So now over the top of the sticky side, get a good bit of the semolina flour. There we go. And that's definitely going to stop our bench, pre uh, bench press, our bench knife from sticking. So now just divide it into four quarters, like that, like that, and like that and I am actually going to scale these. I don't normally bother with um, bread because the more you move it around the more chance you've got of knocking air out but you'll see when we bake these we're going to bake them under a baking tray so there's only going to be about a couple of inches for the bread to rise. So if you have one very big ciabatta it's going to touch the tray on top so I like to keep them all the same size to avoid that happening and also if there's four of you around the table and someone's got a teeny one and someone's got a big one that's going to lead to arguments, so I'll just quickly scale these. Lovely. Okay, so now, where we tip this out, you kind of have it raised in the middle, because that was sort of the thickest part of the bowl, and it gets thinner towards the outside. So if you roll these rectangles up, like that, into a cylinder, you're going to end up with a fat end, that included the bit from the middle, and a thin end. So you kind of want to work with these as a diamond and pull that fat bit from the middle into the middle. 
So fold it over, fold it over again, then pull the thin side up over it, and then pull the sides outwards and just bring them in, not all the way to the middle, otherwise you're going to build up a very, a very thick middle to this. But um, with a ciabatta it's kind of, you don't want it to puff up in the middle like a loaf. If anything, they're sort of concave in the middle, so you want it thinner in the middle, slightly fatter on the outside, but we're going to get that shape when we do our stretch a bit later. So I'll just add a little bit of flour over here, and this is where we can place them for now. So turn that over, as you can see we've got a nice rectangle there, all folded edges, so we've got no cut sides exposed. Pop that there, let's just move that out of the way. Get a little bit of semolina down as well. Okay, so now we'll do this one, so same thing. <coughs> oh, that was my little extra bit. So that's the fat corner. So let's roll that into the middle. And again, take the thin side, flip it over the top, and then the two sides, pull them out to create a bit of tension, bring that one in. So about a, a, a third of the way in, same on the other side, turn it over, and there we've got our nice rectangle again, so that one can go there. We'll take this one, pull that side down, so fat end, fold that in a couple of times to the middle, fold the thin end and stretch it over, and then take the two sides, stretch them out, fold that one in about a third, that one in about a third, and flip it back over. We've got our nice oh, sticky rectangle. And the last one, we'll spin it round because that is the fat end. So again, fold the fat end in a couple of times, the thin end out and up, and then the two sides out and in out and in, flip it over, so that's our fourth rectangle. So now that is really their final shape, but we will leave them to rest just for half an hour to relax, for those seams to seal, they'll come up to room temperature, and then we can just give them a final little stretch to get that ciabatta shape before we put them on the baking tray for their final proof. So cover them with a tea towel, uh, and join me in 30 minutes. Okay, so that's been about half an hour. The dough has just had time to relax into its new shape. It's puffed up a little bit as it's come up to room temperature and all those seams underneath will have kind of sealed back together. So now what we want to do is just give these, like I said, this they've had their final shape but we just want to give them a little stretch to get that ciabatta shape before we give them their final proof. Now traditionally, or classically, these would be proofed on a couche, which is like a, a thick linen sheet that's dusted with flour that can be sort of crimped up to create channels to proof your dough in. If you've got one of them and you want to use that, perfect. If you haven't, you can use a tea towel to similar effect, but I've come up with what I think is a a nifty solution uh, to sort of bypass all that, make it a little bit easier, a little less messy, and we're just going to be using some baking parchment on the baking sheet we're going to cook them on. So what you'll need is, like I say, a bit of baking parchment, cut to the width of your baking sheet, but about 20-25 centimetres longer. So like that, and also normally we'd cook our bread in a Dutch oven to, you know, to create that steamy environment and maximise the oven spring, but we're not going to fit that in a Dutch oven. So you need to find another tray that you can put on top to create that little micro environment of steam. I've actually got an identical tray, so I'll just sit that on top and that's going to create my uh, little Dutch oven. But if you haven't got one that's exactly the same, you could use the bottom of a grill pan, for instance, and that sits on top. It's not quite as long, and when I've used this, 
uh, and the lows puff up, they do get the shape of these handles, but it's a small price to pay. You really do want to cover them so that they will puff up to their maximum, uh, which you'll only get with that kind of steamy environment. So, what we want to do is sprinkle a little bit of flour on here because we don't want them to stick whilst they're proofing. They certainly won't stick once they're cooked because once they're crisped up it won't stick to this baking parchment. But again, whilst they're proofing we still need a bit of flour to stop that sticking. So I'll use a combination of the rice flour and the semolina flour. We'll just doubly make sure they don't, so I'll put a little bit on there as well. So you just want to pick each one up like that, hold the two ends and stretch it out from the middle. So give it a pull, just gently, you certainly don't want to tear it, but you just want to make it kind of as long as your pan and then lay it in there like that. Grab the next one, do exactly the same thing. So hold it, put your thumbs down, give it a little stretch, if you give it a shake it just helps it. And now place that on a couple of inches away from the first one, like that, and now just pinch the paper between them, like that, and it comes up and it will create a little wall of parchment paper between the two doughs. And that's created that kind of couche. Uh, now the dough can proof up without touching each other uh, and we'll get our nice shape. And the whole point of this is, once they've proofed, we'll just be able to pull that paper back and it will stretch the um, sheet out, the space will come between them and we can just bake them straight away without having to pick them up and move them again. Because uh, if they're on a couche you need to have one of those boards so you can flip them out and everything. So we're really just trying to make it simpler. So a final bit of semolina on these just to stop them sticking. So pinch the paper. There we go. And then the last one. My bench knife sits in there perfectly. It'll just create a little wall on the end to stop it spreading that way. And that now can sit for an hour at room temperature for its final proof. So I'm going to cover that with a tea towel. Now these are fairly forgiving, like I've said. If you proof them longer, you could probably go two hours, three hours. They'll still puff up, they'll be nice and light. But what I have found, if you extend the proof, I sort of did it thinking I'd get really nice big air pockets, but actually what I found is the pockets become more even. I think they may sort of bubble inside and the bubbles burst and gradually they just, you get lots of them, but they're more evenly sized. After an hour, seems to be the sort of optimal point, you get those big pockets and the little pockets, which is the sort of crumb I'm after. So I'm going to leave them for an hour and I'll show you what to do next. Okay, so they've proved for their final hour at room temperature. We can see they've puffed up a little bit, nice and soft. We've got some really big air bubbles, some big, that they'll char on the oven. We'll get a slight blistering on the outside, which is great. So now, my little trick, if we remove that, you can just pull that paper and look at that. They all come apart, holding their shape nicely. You haven't got to worry about transferring them out of a couche onto a baking tray. So just get them nice and evenly spaced and then get your second tray, put that on top. Now I've got my oven preheated to 250 degrees. That's going to go in like that for 15 minutes. Then I'll take this tray off uh, and continue to cook them for another 10 minutes with the oven turned down to about 200 degrees. Also, when you take the lid off, just rotate the tray to make sure you're not getting any hot spots and any bits of browning quicker than others. So there'll be a total of 25 minutes cooking. Um, so join me then and we'll have a look at the results. Fingers crossed, I think they're going to be good. So there we have it, the final ciabatta, looking pretty good. 
quite happy with them. This one's a little misshapen. We've kind of got a ciabatta on that end and a baguette on that end. But I think that was the one that had that little flap of dough on it, which has stopped it expanding. Or maybe I had them too tightly uh, concertina together when they were in their couche. But overall, pretty happy with that. You want to get them onto a cooling rack, allow them to cool for about an hour so they don't get uh, soggy bottoms. Um, but I've let these cool for about 20 minutes, but I do want to cut into one as part of the video so we can see the texture we've got inside. So I'm going to take this one and we'll see what the crumbs like. Try not to chop my finger off. There we go. Looking pretty good actually. I'm quite happy with that. Nice and open. Uh, which bit shall we try? Let's go for this. Mm. Nice and chewy ciabatta. Thin crust but crispy. Just taste that little bit of olive oil in there. But yeah, I'm really pleased with that. Look at that. Mm -mm -mm. Give that one a go yourself. I did have a request to make um, ciabatta rolls. So you could follow this recipe exactly until you get to the point where you're stretching them before they're final proof. Once you stretch them, cut each one into two or three. If you did three, you'd get like 12 rolls out of this. And then proof them the same way. So put three per channel on your couche, but just put one at the top end, one at the bottom, and one in the middle, as far apart as possible. They'll probably proof into each other a bit and bake into each other, but then you'll be able to tear them apart afterwards and you'll get your 12 rolls. But they've come out really well. I'm actually happy with that. And it's taken a little while to kind of well, perfect to this recipe. I know there's still room for improvement, but follow that and you should get a pretty similar result and you can certainly improve on it. My next video is probably going to be uh, another sourdough ball. So I've got my foolproof sourdough recipe, but the next one's just going to be taking up, uh, raising the hydration probably to around 75%, uh, trying to get that sort of more open crumb that people are after. Uh, but in the meantime, do try this one because it's going to get you used to using that higher hydration dough. This was at 81%, so you'll actually be going down if we go to 75 and things are just going to feel a lot easier. Give this one a go. That'll make some great sandwiches. If you've got a uh, panini toaster, then that would be absolutely perfect. But until next time, as always, give it a thumbs up. Leave your comments below. Please keep subscribing and ciao bella.